Hello everyone. Um, we wanted to record a video on refusals for you. This is Dr. Carol's uh, PowerPoint on important aspects of refusals that should really be included in everybody's chart. So Jerry has some very important quotes here where before you leave a patient who's refusing, make sure that you covered all your bases and make sure that it would also hold up in court. So here's some agenda and goals. All right, so let's go over who's a patient. Just everybody is that calls 911. Every patient gets a full assessment and chart for people who activate EMS themselves, identify themselves as a patient with an injury or illness, altered mental status, anyone that is assessed, anyone that is lifted, assisted, or moved by EMS, any individual that's fallen. So a pretty, pretty wide variety of people here. And then who can refuse? It comes down to capacity. So AO times three and you know, can carry on a conversation, can have a full conversation with you and really understands what's going on. Not somebody who can tell you their name and then has no other idea of what's going on at all. So here is Dr. Carroll's paragraph that would be a good idea to include in every EMS chart. Our patient was offered transport to the closest appropriate hospital or other hospital of their choice within a reasonable geographic distance, resources permitting. Our patient was made aware of any concerning findings on physical exam and made aware of possible increased morbidity and mortality from refusing care. It may also be a good idea that you also spell out that morbidity and mortality means worsening of their symptoms, permanent disability, or death especially using the word death so that patients understand. Our patient was encouraged to seek care independently or to call 911 back for any reason. EMS discussed current concerns with family on scene and listed their aid in convincing the patient to allow transport. EMS spent an extended amount of time on scene to thoroughly evaluate and observe patient and make sure that the patient understood the situation and our concerns. Our patient was reassured that EMS was not angry with the patient and will promptly respond to any of their emergency needs in the future. We spent however much time with this patient and observed no deterioration in their condition. Our patient was left with, whether it be family, neighbors, home nurse, just please document that also. So let's dissect this down a little bit here. So offer transport to the closest appropriate hospital or hospital of their choice. Make sure to have that discussion with them. Made aware of possible increased morbidity and mortality, again, death and disability. Call back 911 for any reason. Please reiterate that they're not upset. We're not upset with them. It's not you know a waste of our time to come out. Patients can change their mind at any time and that's okay but we wanna make sure that they call us back if they need us and don't think that we're gonna be upset, angry, what may have you. Just, we wanna do our job and do the best for the patient. You discuss the concerns with the family on the scene and enlisted their aid. Sometimes family members can help also show their concern for the patient, but also once you leave, it's important to make sure that there's somebody there who can call 911 in case they rapidly deteriorate. It's also important to share your concerns with the family on scene because they may have never had these symptoms before or something else from the lookout in case the patient does deteriorate. EMS spent an extended amount of time on scene. That's important. Walking up, having a quick conversation with somebody and leaving doesn't allow you to really assess them, do a full assessment of them, of their vital signs, of their exam, but also to really have that good conversation of why did you call? What are your concerns? And why don't you want to go? Because you also have to discuss the consequences of not going. So that will take time. Don't rush those conversations because sometimes you'll you'll find out other things that may that may encourage the patient to go to the hospital more. Again, EMS is not angry. It's our job to take care of patients. 
making sure that you showed that you were on scene with this patient for a while and made sure that they didn't deteriorate. You know, are they still talking to you at the end of your observation time? Are their, are their vital signs still stable at the end of their observation time? Did you see them get up and walk? You know, are they still doing okay when you're leaving them? And again, our patient was left with, are they being left by themselves? Is that a high risk refusal at that point? Because if the patient deteriorates, who's going to help them? Who's going to call 911 back for them? So try to make sure that somebody's left with somebody else that can help them. Call 911 back, recognize symptoms of them deteriorating, anything like that is, is safer to leave the patient with. And then overall, sometimes the refusals are like Dr. Carroll's refusal, but making sure that something, if something bad happens, you want to know that you did everything in your power that you could to take care of that patient. Not that you cleared the scene quickly, not that you were, you know, going back to going back to the station or going to get food. Make sure that you take that time to really assess that patient and have a good conversation so that you know that you did everything you could. And when something's really not going right, call for ALS, call for the supervisor, call for law enforcement, enlist the help of family and friends. You can also call for medical command when you think the patient's high risk and you really want them to go. If you're unsure if they have capacity, if anything doesn't feel right about the situation, if they have a lot of medical conditions and something's just not sitting right, you can always enlist the help of medical command. And then medical command will have that conversation with you. They're going to want more information to really make that good decision for the patient. So let's take a quick look at some higher risk refusals. Hypoglycemia. This is a pretty big one. And we just had uh, protocol updates where this is now on the back of your EMS charts listing kind of the, the higher risk refusals of this, um, including what medications do they take? Are they on saponoureas? Are they ill? Do they have new, new kidney failure? Is there any intentional overdose? Is there anybody there that can call on all one in case their blood sugar drops again? Has this ever happened to them before? There's a wide variety of of different things that could be going on that's very concerning and really deserves the time and really good discussion about that. Because especially at night, when people aren't watching that patient who go hypoglycemic and may not wake up or may be hypoglycemic for a prolonged period of time. So very important to very care, uh, carefully assess their risks. On your hypoglycemic refusal checklist in the protocol update, hypoglycemic factors include a repeat blood glucose of less than 60. Um, if it, that is yes, that is high risk. If they're not taking anything by mouth, that's also high risk. If there's no one there to help them, if they're unaccompanied, that's high risk. If they're unable to verbalize follow-up and emergency plans, that is also high risk. If it's intentional or accidental incorrect dosing of insulin, that's also high risk. And then taking a sulfonylurea is high risk. So please look through your protocols to find the list of sulfonylureas and review why those are high risk and dangerous. Another high risk refusal is an overdose that is given Narcan because they may be initially stable to refuse, but it's also very concerning making sure that they don't have any other signs of trauma, um, neuro deficits, abnormal vital signs, but also being aware that sometimes the Narcan wears off before the substance that they use does. So important that the patient understands that, that there's, because it is a high risk that as soon as that Narcan wears off, that patient may become apneic again, um, unresponsive and basically overdose all over again. Um, so make sure to have that good discussion, try to get them into clinic. Um, definitely the leave takeaway Narcans are also fantastic, but really having that good conversation and making sure that they understand that. So taking a look at this case, this is another high-risk refusal. You have an 88-year-old family or a patient. The family calls because they're short of breath. The patient has a history of dementia as AO times two normally. Um, patient appears okay. 
maybe it was short of breath earlier, maybe everybody was overacting, everything looks fine now, but this patient needs a vital sign, then needs a full set of vitals because we don't know why they were all of a sudden having shortness of breath. So overall, the vital signs could show that they're khaki. Could that be a, a pulmonary embolism? Could they have a fever that's concerning for pneumonia? Could they have an increased respiratory rate that's concerning for a multitude of things? So you need to assess their mental, their mental status, orientation, any changes from baseline, any abnormal vital signs. And really you need to call medical command for the refusal because she's AO times two. And really that's, that's, a, that's a difficult refusal. So please get medical command involved in this one and recognize that just because she looks great now doesn't mean that she doesn't have something underlying, especially with her lungs or her heart. This is another high-risk refusal because it involves an 18-year-old trauma, intoxication. All of those, the trauma and intoxication are high-risk of refusal. So do a full assessment of this patient. Take a full set of vital signs. Can this patient talk to you? Can they carry on a conversation? Can they repeat back the risks of refusal? Definitely call medical command on this one. So some other cases that are very high risk, you know, a 35 year old that fell off a bar stool, refused, now they're dead the next day. They could have had a subdural, they could have had a multitude of things, um, but high risk again. A 65 year old with a language barrier and a chart dead two hours later. You do have language um, assistance capabilities. Please talk to your supervisors if you're unsure but you should be use, talking to somebody in their preferred language to obtain a refusal um, so that they really understand the risks. 75 year old lift assist, period code, you know, a few days later, and a 19 year old with, with alcohol on board, are they really able to, to re, uh, reiterate the risks or are they just very intoxicated and not safe for refusal? So a lot of things to give pause on, but also to make sure that you're aware of, okay? So definitely use your resources, do a full assessment and really make sure that you know that you did the best for this patient before you let them refuse. Dr. Carroll's always open for questions and also take a good, good look at your local protocols and make sure that you're doing the best for your patients. Thanks.